Thanks everyone for joining. Apologies for the delay. We are working through some, some technical difficulties with our videos, but we're all here. I will give it maybe another 30 seconds or so in, in the hopes that folks are trickling in and then we'll, we'll get started. So I'll ask our panelists with working videos to turn on your cameras if you can. Well, let's go ahead and get started since we're a little after three. I want to welcome everyone. Um, my name is Jessica Arians. I'm the Senior Program Manager for Climate and Energy Policy at the National Wildlife Federation. Um, thanks for joining this Clean Energy Roundtable. This is Session 3F, the Leveraging the Clean Energy Industry to Advance Environmental and Energy Justice. And we have a really esteemed panel of clean energy developers and advocates who are going to share their thoughts about the role of their industry in advancing equity and justice. Our panelists represent a diverse mix of companies and orgs working here in the Mid-Atlantic, as well as nationally and internationally. And we're fortunate that some are also partners in the Thriving Communities Technical Assistance Center, or TICTAC, which I'm sure you've heard a lot about um, at the symposium, which I hope speaks to the excitement of NWF and Siege and, and many, many other partners about this five-year project as we launch it. One of our objectives with TICTAC is to help build the capacity of underserved, overburdened, and rural communities to engage with business and industry in decision-making, and to address environmental and energy injustices. And so I hope this session sheds some, shed some light onto this area and opportunities for this kind of engagement. I think uh, this is a really exciting and important time to be talking about and working on energy and environmental justice, not just because of the TICTAC launch, but because of the massive amounts of federal investment in, clean, in climate and clean energy, thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act. These bills are already bringing lots of environmental and economic benefits to communities. And I think they have the potential to bring a lot more, particularly to frontline and fence line communities, but only if we get the implementation right. And I know our panelists are, are also thinking a lot about these issues. So I'm excited to hear about kind of challenges and opportunities they see in this space. So without further ado, let's turn to our panel. We're gonna hear a little bit from each panelist about their work that they do. Uh, full bios for, for each panelist are available on the Siege website, so I'm not going to, to do a full bio for our esteemed panelists. Um, and then we'll turn to questions. Um, so folks should leave questions in the in the comments section if you're available, if you can, and we'll um, we'll get to the discussion. So first we'll hear from Dr. Elvis Maleka. He's the Vice President of Labs and Data Science at Groundswell. Dr. Maleka has more than 15 years of progressive experience in finance, risk management, and quantitative analytics, worked with major Wall Street banks, economic firms, and many other places besides. So Dr. Maleka, tell us a little bit about your work and Groundswell. Thank you so much, uh, Jessica, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'll start by introducing uh, what Groundswell does. So first thing is that we are a mission-driven and values-aligned um, organization. So as a 501c3 nonprofit organization headquartered in DC, but we have offices in Lynchburg, Virginia, as well as uh, LaGrange, Georgia, we practically build community power to uh, equitable community solar projects, including resiliency hubs across the country. And the goal is to reduce uh, energy burdens uh, and the way we do this is that uh, we have the research team which I lead, and that kind of informs, you know, program de uh, design and implementation for some of the regions that we cover. Uh, we have three main verticals. We have our subscriber management services team, uh, including our share power model within that team that uh, kind of ensures that uh, our services are inclusive. So it includes both empowered and market rate customers. We're also involved in uh, community engagement and subscriber support, including billing uh, by our share power model. And what that does is that it kind of show up uh, even, uh, trust and transparency in the industry. Uh, then I lead the labs, the labs team. Uh, we talk a lot about labs uh, research and why that is really important, especially uh, within the current uh, regulatory environment that we find ourselves in. 
Uh, thirdly, we have a project development team that is involved with all the projects, you know, the deals that we 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 have you know in terms of developing uh clean power to communities that really need it the most uh including um different community solar projects and resiliency hubs so uh as jessica did mention uh i started uh in academia spent a couple of years in academia more than 15 years and i decided that it was time to uh to help the banks you know so i worked uh as a model validator and a senior auditor with some of the mainstream uh Wall Street banks, you know, uh, developing some of their models and just ensuring that the model has been developed by in compliance. I've been in the clean energy space for uh, uh, three years plus, you know, but uh, background, uh, I'm an economist by training. I also spent some time uh, lecturing statistics and econometrics. So what you'll be hearing from me today is more or less how research is being informed and uh, the implementation part of research design framework, including tools and how we can leverage it with respect to our current policy uh, environment. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Malika. appreciate that. Next, we're gonna hear from Jacob Hanna. Uh, he is the Chief Conservation Officer for Coalfield Development from West by God, Virginia. His background includes working on triple bottom sustainability concepts for coal towns in central Pennsylvania, as well as social sustainability programs in Western Maryland and many other things besides. Uh, Jacob, tell us a little bit about your work and what Coalfield does. Sure, uh, and ahead of time, apologies, folks, if you hear any background. I'm sort of on the streets right now in D.C., making my rounds um, and uh, actually presenting on a lot of the work that we're doing. I got a big old cutout boards of some stuff I'll be talking about later today, but basically we're a nonprofit organization that focuses on workforce development and training coal-impacted folks to install solar panels, to reclaim former strip mine sites, coal mine sites, uh, and reinvigorate their communities and towns that normally would be coal dependent. Uh, we do all that through the people in those communities. And we've been around for about 13 years, and now we've banded together a large coalition from that cutout board I was showing you and has leveraged over $100 million now to uh, completely transform 21 counties in West Virginia towards what we call Appalachian climate technologies. So solar panel, panel manufacturing, recycling, installation, abandoned myland restoration, brownfield remediation, um, community training and workforce development, unionized uh, engagement for uh, trainees as well, um, so on and so forth. They could go all day about it, but um, excited to be here and excited to talk about the work here together. Thanks so much, Jacob. Appreciate it. Um, next, we're going to hear from Eric Antakal. Eric is the Director of Workforce Development at Orsted, an experienced program designer and worker advocate specializing in skilled trades careers and inclusion of overburdened groups in those careers. And he's especially focused on construction and operations careers in the offshore wind industry. Eric, can you tell us a little bit more about your work and um, in workforce development at Orsted? Yeah, absolutely, and, and thanks for having us. It's, uh, it's great to be with all of you. Um, so Orsted, first off, is uh, the global and U.S. leader in offshore wind. Uh, so we have uh, we've installed and operate more offshore wind turbines than uh, than anybody else uh, outside of China, um, and we have the largest uh, U.S. portfolio of offshore wind um, as well. So. Um, in my role, um, so I, I mainly, uh, of course, look at workforce development um, and think about environmental justice uh, as being served in some small way uh, by workforce development, not the entire picture of environmental justice, but but certainly uh, one of the, the pieces of, of how we get to some form of justice. Uh, <clears throat> so as you mentioned, um, I focus on uh, the construction careers and the operations careers um, pretty heavily uh, as they relate to offshore wind, uh, but also uh, work on a, a variety of different um, subsectors that touch offshore wind um, as, as places where we want to uh, reach into communities that, that have been uh, left behind and disinvested from um, for, for decades, if not longer, um, and help pull folks um, into manufacturing careers, engineering careers, project management, maritime crew, um, and, a, and a host of other careers where, um, where folks who have felt the, the the worst burdens of uh, of the fossil fuel economy um, get into um, a, a now uh, hopefully high paying job um, and and career um, in the trades whether they work full time uh, for the rest of their career in in offshore wind is is really irrelevant to me uh, it's really uh, the opportunity that folks have to have that long career. Um, 
uh, regardless of whether uh, um, offshore wind is uh, is is uh, their employer. It's really more uh, that that skill set is going to carry them uh, forward uh, and enable them to work on offshore wind projects, but also enable them to work on a host of other uh, different um, industries. Great, thank you so much. Um, and next, we're going to hear from Kara Humphrey. Uh, Chief Revenue Officer for Neighborhood Sun, uh, where she oversees the sales team as well as their community partnerships program. Uh, in addition to her years in the solar industry, Kara has a background in commercial energy efficiency in the hybrid vehicle industry and has bravely man uh, navigating video issues. Um, <laughs> we appreciate Kara, tell us a little bit more about yourself and your work at Neighborhood Sun. Yes, thank you, Jessica, and thank you, everybody, um, for having us here today with this uh, esteemed group. Um, my name is Kara Humphrey. Um, I'm CRO of Neighborhood Sun. Neighborhood Sun is a community solar provider based in Maryland. Uh, we're the leading community solar provider when it comes to customer care and corporate responsibility. Um, we white label our, our software management software, excuse me, our solar management software to help other community solar providers increase access to community solar. As a company, you know, energy equity and the well-being of our customers has always been kind of at, at the heart of what we do. Uh, advocating for policies that increase access and benefits for low and moderate income households, even if they're, you know, these efforts aren't necessarily better for our bottom line. Um, as a for-profit company, we're a B Corp public benefit company, um, and we've always kind of taken this approach to community solar as a um, our mission is really to empower individuals to participate in this clean energy transition that, that we're uh, in the midst of and to make change through collective action. Um, part of our mission is to redistribute the benefits of clean energy in an equitable manner. Um, and through our um, SHARE program, which is Solar Helps Advance Residential Equality um, and the Neighborhood Benefit, excuse me, Neighborhood Benefit Fund, um, we can give additional savings to those folks that um, can use the help the most. Um, we've been based in Maryland since 2016. We're a grassroots community solar company. Um, and very proud of our work with the certified B corporations globally. We've earned the, the title of best for the world in the environment category for a couple years running. And, um, you know, it's, it's tough work, but it's extremely re uh, rewarding to, um, you know, get into communities have an opportunity to help them understand the details with community solar and to really increase the adoption of clean energy for all. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Cara. And you're, you're bravely navigating video issues and me mispronouncing your name. So apologies for that. Um, we have one more panelist who I think was on, but had to drop off John Redcloud, who I know is traveling. So if John hops on, I'll introduce him and we'll hear from him. But but um, appreciate all our panelists kind of giving us that that groundwork on, on your work and your organization. Um, oh, and I see John joined. John, are you able to, to, to speak a little bit, a little intro to your work and yourself? Sure. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank everyone you. Can hear me okay? Yeah. Yep, we can hear you fine. Yep. Greetings, everyone. My name is John Red Cloud. I serve as the managing director for Red Cloud Renewable. We are a grassroots nonprofit based on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota, home to the Oglala Lakota people. There are 30 to 35,000 tribal members that live on our reservation, uh, about 2.8 million acres, lots of wide open space. Uh, what Red Cloud Renewable does is we provide workforce development for Native Americans across the country from all 574 tribes. We are a first of a kind, one of a kind 
fully functional renewable energy training center on the Indian reservation. And while it's a great uh, position to be in, we don't want to be an island. We want to have our models scaled and replicated across the country so other tribal members can also learn to become what my dad calls solar warriors. You know, with our organization, we believe it's a perfect blend of technology with harnessing renewable energy, solar power, and also paying respect and honoring the past. So we say it's a new way to honor the old ways and it's a blending of tradition and science. So Red Cloud Renewable Energy Center today has trained about 1,100 Native American students. And we believe with this Solar for All competition and other funding that's coming out from the passage of the IRA, and of course the very important Justice 40 initiative there, that we're going to increase the foothold of tribal communities in deploying the solar workforce for tomorrow's energy future. Um, so we're proud of our work and we're looking for partnerships and you know, we're looking for um, additional ways to provide that Native American perspective in some of these energy roundtables. I've heard my dad and others say, you know, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu, you know, so to speak. So we don't want to, we don't want to be that. So we're grateful for the opportunity here, grateful to Jessica and NWF. Um, I'm also proud to serve on the inaugural Environmental Justice Advisory Committee for the National Wildlife Federation. We had a great event in Lake Tahoe earlier this year. I think we have plenty of positive things in the works. So thank you for inviting me and I'm glad, glad to be here. Sorry about the camera issue there. No worries, John, appreciate it. Thank you so much for sharing about Red Cloud Renewable and, and for all your work. Um, yeah, so we're going to jump into to the discussion. I think my first question is is for sort of everyone who feels who feels compelled to jump in. Um, and you all spoke in different ways about kind of your and environmental justice in your work and your organization. Um, and you know, there's different kinds of definitions of environmental justice as well as sort of a lot of definitions of energy equity and energy justice. So would love to hear more about how your organization thinks about sort of energy equity in particular and whether you see a role for your you know, company organization in advancing energy equity, whether the clean energy industry as a whole has a role to play and should be thinking about equity in the work. A big question, but if someone wants to jump in. Dr. Malika, so you came off mute. Yeah, uh, I'll go ahead and start and uh, hopefully my colleagues will add to that. So um, I think the first thing is that uh, collaboration is really needed yet for us to be able to ensure that uh, uh, incentives are really designed, incentives that are designed really meet, addresses the needs of people that need it the most, you know. So I think it's a collaborative effort and that is why partnership is really important, especially with grassroots organization as well as community-based organization. The way we um, we define energy equity, you know, uh, I spoke at a webinar on the 28th of August this year, and the topic was about energy equity. So the very first thing is for us to be able to understand what that means in terms of access, affordability, restorative energy efficiency, uh, being inclusive, you know, in programs that really include uh, involve uh, LMI communities, you know, uh, but looking at some of uh, the Justice 40 uh, definitions, it also includes, you know, access to capital, especially low cost uh, funds and access to capital. Uh, and, uh, so we look at the, all of the issues, you know, the needs that kind of really uh, confront LMI community. So the very first thing is to understand what their, challenge, uh, uh, their challenges are. And the second thing that we do very well at Groundswell is to be able to look at it from a distributional equity perspective, you know, so uh, just ensuring that, you know, policies that are being designed, you know, be it funding, you know, everyone talks about the recent legislations uh, are kind of addressing, you know, some of these issues. So, for example, uh, policy designs in such a way that, you know, uh, it involves LMI, you know. So after looking at those distributional aspects and some of the things that I do here at labs is to be able to understand the policy framework and how we can implement that policy framework in some of the uh, the work that we do here. And so what that implies is that from a, um, a procedural perspective now, 
we now look at all of the challenges that LMI face, you know, and look at it from a distributional perspective, you know, uh, try to understand the policy landscape and now being able now to quantify it from a design perspective and an implementation perspective. And so uh, we work collaboratively here at Groundswell, so that involves working with all of our teams, you know, to be able to ensure that there are specific matrices attached. And another thing that we did recently is just to lay a framework, you know, for uh, any organization to be able to understand equity. Because the idea, the aspect about equity is that, you know, uh, everyone talks about it. And, you know, people say, hey, there needs to be any uh, energy equity. But by what means are we measuring energy equity? How can we tell that we've actually attained a certain level of energy equity if we don't know what those matrices are and if we don't uh, define them properly? So uh, that's kind of a framework, uh, the bit like kind of theoretical that we use here. Thank you. Yeah, that that point about you know measuring the progress or measuring the baseline is really key, and I know something um, Siege is is working on a lot with with the, their GIS and geospatial work. Um, anyone else want to jump in with thoughts? Eric, can they come up and you? Yeah, happy to. Uh, so I, I, I want to key off of that that point about about measuring um, and and yes, and it to say that uh, it's it's really important to us to to see who's measuring it. And I think it's you know it's important that that we have not just uh, measurement from folks who are actually residing in communities that have experienced energy injustice um but but those folks uh also sort of shaping how we're implementing any kind of um, justice-based initiative um, and informing the entire process along the way um yeah so so to give an example here in, in the mid-atlantic uh we we are in the midst of a um uh, of, of starting a cohort of uh, wind turbine technician students. Um, so in, in this case, you know, our, our operations and maintenance facility is, is being built in Atlantic City. Uh, we have a, a group of neighborhood residents, uh, our, our community advisory board that has been with us for, for years now, who has been advising us. We've built these relationships. And so taking this very long-term approach to understanding concerns, um, particularly about jobs and um, people give, uh, you know, us and the community college and, and politicians who are all excellent, uh, you know, and, and very supportive at developing this program. But many of the unique aspects of the program, including including student stipends, the way supportive services have, have been factored in, um, transportation mechanisms, um, different kind of small uh, bonuses like like rock climbing gym memberships uh, during the program to kind of work on fear of heights and work on on physical fitness at the same time. These are all suggestions that have been that have been sort of um, I'm not going to say suggested. They've been demanded uh, by local communities who who understand the folks that we are trying to train and then employ. Um, and so I think there's there's often a, a a thought process among developers that hey, you know, this is this is an extra thing or this is some additional cost that we need to incur in order to deliver on you know energy justice or some sort of sustainability initiative. When really it, it's it's something that improves the initiative as a whole, it improves the success, and it, it improves the uh, the amount that that the the funding that you do can can stretch over an initiative. Um, so I think really important that you, that you know there's that long term relationship building, um, and there's really no substitute for it. That's a really powerful example. Thank you for sharing. Um, that might be a, a good segue into a question for you, Jacob, to talk a little bit about the workforce development model that Coalfield has. Um, and kind of the, I think it'd be interested to hear more too about like that, that model and especially about removing barriers to employment and thinking about groups like returning citizens and making sure they can access the clean energy industry. We'd just love to hear more from you about that model and kind of any lessons that Coalfield has learned from that that you think the, the energy industry, clean energy industry should kind of take take from and listen to? Sure. Uh, so just for context, we're located in West Virginia, which was the highest coal producing state from the 1800s up to the 1980s. And so for us, environmental justice is an outcome of a just transition. So there needs to be a transition from one energy to another, and it has to be just. It has to bring along how we define a just transition is uh, the first fruits of a new economy should first and foremost benefit those left behind by the previous economy in a sustainable way. So if you're a former coal miner, if you're someone who lost their job due to the collapse of the coal industry, if you're someone who is exiting recovery because you didn't have a job, because 
you were out of employment and from the depression factors that come with all those things, then those are the folks that we want to focus on. And those are the opportunities that we think are um, should be positioned to help folks in those regions. And so what we do is we've trained over 1,700 people, uh, created over 700 new jobs for those types of folks facing barriers to employment. Um, and so right now, actually, this week, we have a cohort uh, of trainees learning from Solar Energy International, SEI. Um, they're taking their curriculum right now in our uh, remodeled warehouse uh, and learning the basics of solar. But before we even take them through that, there is sort of a, there's just an educational component of, you know, how do we even depoliticize solar? How do you take apart the, the weaponization and the myths that have been perpetuated in Appalachia uh, through a myriad of different reasons? Uh, so how do we how do we take apart all that and, and just show the benefits that this is what it can save you? These are the environmental benefits. And here's the jobs that pay X amount and, and here's these union opportunities with that. So just going through and just resetting the narrative first and then deploying these training opportunities for these folks who normally wouldn't have opportunities otherwise. Uh, and for us, it's it's a little bit of a race because right now there's a, a lot of funding to deploy solar, especially on top of former strip mine sites. And for us, we could see that and say, okay, I need like 700 new installers right now, and I'm going to hire them from outside the region because they're already ready. And it, no, we don't want to do that because that's just going to be another form of extracting communities for their resources, extracting uh, you know this this affordable land for energy production, and we don't want to do that again. And so. Uh, we're really trying to take our time here and a way to do that to bake in these best practices is that we're working with all these for-profit developers we're a nonprofit. we're working with for-profit developers on community benefit agreements uh, com community benefit plans stating you're going to utilize this site and these communities for x project x percentage has to go into benefiting this community x x amount of revenues have to go into an economic development fund to help revitalize the downtown uh, whatever it may be, you know, we would negotiate with the company and the community, but figuring out how to localize those benefits and localize those opportunities because a lot of our folks, they're just now getting their driver's license back. They're just now getting, you know, uh, off of uh, substance use. They're they're expunging a record. They're trying to find affordable housing. So it's not just enough to offer a, a good job. A good job's up here and you're expecting someone to like climb and navigate through all those barriers to reach it and they'll never be able to maintain it unless you provide uh, the the tools and the wraparound services to detangle those generations worth of uh, disinvestment, disenfranchisement, uh, and and lack of opportunity in Appalachia. And so it's it's a long game that we're playing. It's a long haul, and we kind of have to. And we think that's just the right way to do it. If you're going to invest in communities and people, it's going to take more than just you know a three hour training and over pizza, you know, and say you got a job. And instead, it's, it's going to take a little while. And that's okay because that builds trust and relationships and adoption of this technology where, you know, coal used to be the battleground for this topic. You know, we called it the war on coal when solar energy came into the region. A lot of folks were very defensive. And so how do we, again, dismantle all these myths and notions and, and make it a, a tool in our toolbox for solar? Thank you, Jacob. Yeah, I'm hearing, and, and you and, and, and with Eric's last comments, kind of the needing to take the time that it takes to, to work authentically with communities. Um, and that's that requires a lot of time. And this is something we talk about on my team at the National Wildlife Federation. It requires a lot of time, but there's also this pressure with all this federal funding kind of flowing now. And how do we how do we square that circle? Um, but on, in terms of kind of community work, uh, Cara, I want to turn to you because I'm, I'm, I would love to hear more about, you know, I know grassroots and community organizing is really important in your work. Um, and I'm, I would love to hear more about how a company like Neighborhood Sun thinks about that and thinks about community engagement. How do you kind of practice it? How do you do it authentically? Are you also thinking about the time it takes to work with communities? I would love to hear more about your philosophy there. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, um, you know, a lot of what we're hearing is about um, the workforce development that's needed and for building the infrastructure. And a lot of what Neighborhood Sun is focused on is spreading the word and increasing adoption of that renewable energy um, through community solar. And, um, and, and 
if if we look back at kind of the history of energy going back to the er, the early days of the oil boom and even before that when you know oil barons were coming into um native lands and killing off native american indians to access oil and then over the course of time you know i think most people in the United States anyways are are don't really think of of energy as having their their best will in mind, you know and um, so and this has been perpetuated over time through deregulated energy, giving consumers the ability to kind of choose, where their energy comes from, and then the the very um, wide path that's kind of been torched across deregulated energy states, Maryland being one, you know, most of the Northeast has deregulated energy, and um, the predatory business practices that have kind of, kind of really taken advantage of those that were looking to save a little bit of money on their energy bills. So um, keeping that all in mind and the fact that, you know, we're, we're trying to inspire the public to adopt something that's new, that's different, and um, has some complications that comes along with it. It's not, you know, there's there's a lot to unpack here, but you know, uh, policy and regulations around things like community solar in new programs doesn't always align with the overarching goal, which is to increase um, the adoption of renewable energy, give people access to the benefits from renewable energy, and um, and, and reduce those barriers. The policies and the regulations do do not always match that intention. And um, so in addition to, you know, partnering with uh, and collaborating with organizations and CBOs and uh, higher education institutions and faith-based organizations and environmental groups to collaborate on a grassroots level to spread the word and to, to um, use trusted leaders to help us reach, you know, disenfranchised and underserved communities that have largely, you know, predominantly been, um, you know, kind of underserved by the utility companies and they typically have the lowest carbon footprint, but they have the most environmental degradation. So we're doing a lot to not only educate and and inform and build trust um but also you know we're we're working steadfastly to influence policy makers and the regulations that are put in place that maybe don't you know maybe they're overly influenced by the utility companies and really do not align with our overarching goal which is to increase um, renewable energy on our grid while we're helping, um, you know, these underserved or just the masses at large. Um, and, you know, I'd be remiss to not mention the fact that, you know, collaboration with organizations not only enables us to be part of a community, but it also helps us give back at, to those organizations and help them achieve their mission. Currently, we're um, partnered with and collaborating with over 100 organizations across the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic, uh, small churches to large universities, all with the intention of increasing awareness and teaching ab people about uh, local energy that's being produced in their area that won't present health risks to them and their family. That's great. Thank you so much, Cara. And 
I think I know there's a question in the chat, but I want to get a couple more questions for to make sure all of our panels have a chance to speak. So I want to I want to turn to you, John. I think you know Cara talked about the the complicated, long, and um, troubling history of of clean energy and energy development in the U.S. And I know Red Cloud Renewable is really trying to to shift some of the narrative around that. Um, and with with your work and with a particular focus on serving tribal nations and tribal communities. So I'd love if you could talk more about some of the, um, the challenges and opportunities you see in developing and deploying clean energy specifically on native lands, on, on reservations, on tribal lands with tribal communities. What are some of the challenges there that you're seeing? And what are the opportunities that you're seeing? Maybe that you know the clean energy industry at large isn't seeing because they're not focused specifically on the tribal perspective, or maybe even nonprofits like NWF, Big Greens aren't seen because we're not, you know, on the ground working with tribal communities in the way that you are. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, as a grassroots nonprofit here, we we know and believe wholeheartedly that we have our pulse on the needs of the community. You know, we're right here amongst the people. Our organization, we were born and raised here on on the Indian reservation, we know some of the challenges. You know, we've we've experienced them from childhood up to today. And one of the one of the major obstacles, I believe, is is how the reservation system was set up. It was imposed on us, of course, but they it it was set up in such a way that the Bureau of Indian Affairs, um, through you know, which is operates originally, it was through the War Department. You know, that's how it came about. Now it's through the Department of the Interior. So the Bureau of Indian Affairs has this, um, they, everything has to pass through them in order for something to happen on this federal, federal trust land, you know, and, and for a while there, um, you know, my dad would joke and he would call the, the BIA bossing Indians around, you know, you have to go to the BIA office in order to get something done. You got to walk your paperwork in there and you have to start there. And that's where this, the, the wheels of bureaucracy kind of churn a little bit slow. So for Red Cloud Renewable, we are not involved with the tribal politics. We're not involved in the in the government. You know, we we have our we have our operation where we reach out to community members, household by household, and we try to educate them. And there's a lot of fear. For example, there's a homeowner that we're looking to put a solar system on her home for for free and she's part of the electrical co-op and she said i'm worried that it's going to take away my check that i get from the co-op and so we have to try and um help her understand the interconnection agreement process with the electrical co-op and she's worried about losing 30 or 40 dollar which doesn't sound like from the hospital prescription or so there are different needs that um, you know it's hard for national leadership to see some of these things in Washington and they're making these these deals and having these omnibus sort of riders on, on on different legislation but we're down here on on the reservation and we're realizing that you know some of these needs are just not and you know being being noticed on, on a large enough scale and with this recent passage of this funding here, we feel like it, it puts some of that, it brings us, you know, makes us a part of the equation. Uh, the solar for all uh, um, is, a, is a perfect example. Um, people have been reaching out to Red Cloud Renewable because of our organization profile. We are a Native American led, you know, workforce development organi on an Indian reservation in an impoverished zone, like a hub zone. And people want to reach out to us uh, because we are doing workforce development, we are training solar installers. We've been doing so for years. We feel like we've been at the solar party for years, and everyone's just Johnny come lately. Like where you guys been? We've we've kind of been around, but now that there's a massive amount of funding coming in, it sure changes the landscape. So for us, we feel like the good thing about this, uh, especially the Justice Forty initiative, and I know there are improvements that can be made. Um, Dr. Malika talked about that. Uh, I completely agree. And we, we, we have what we have today, and we're trying to leverage our, our organization, 
be so responsible to award through advancing equity through workforce partnerships to train Native American women to become solar installers. And we use the federal money coming from taxpayers like all of us here to pay for wraparound child care services. We know we don't want the fact that a that a young woman, Native American woman, is a mother to stand in the way of attaining a career or pursuing a career. So we celebrate that, we champion it, we thank her, and we offer uh, travel stipend, we offer child care, uh, whether in our home community or past coming to our reservation here and utilizing the child care service. So it's one of the ways that we believe we're responsive to the needs here, and we hope others Know, can replicate our program. We're we're hopeful that the government wants to do it correctly, and part of it, it you know depends on who's in the White House. And right now, it's a it's it's good news for those of us who are Native Americans. I don't know if we're going to revert back to the previous administration. I mean, only time will tell. But um, for now, we're we're grateful to have this this initiative, and we think it will pay dividends for tribal communities. Um, once we start to see these these uh, households on the reservations impacted positively. Um, thank you. Thank you, John. Yeah, I'm going to use that uh, solar party metaphor in the future. Um, one more question, then I'll turn to any questions in the chat. But Dr. Malek, I want to switching gears a little bit. Your your I mean, the labs at Groundswell does incredible work using data science and analytics to kind of further an equitable clean energy future. You've talked about that. Um, connecting this back to the TikTok I mentioned earlier, you know, we want to we want to make sure people can, in communities can access that kind of research and use it to, to better their communities to further clean energy industry. So curious if you could share your thoughts about how communities and advocates can use the work that in the research that you're doing to fight for a better clean energy future or to engage with clean energy developers or clean energy industry? Yeah, that's a very good question. Thanks so much for that, Jessica. Uh, I think uh, the very first thing is that uh, when I left uh, the finance industry, you know, and I came into the solar industry, one of the things I was really concerned in the banking industry is there's just a lot of uh, financial engineering, you know, all these methods, development, you know, research and, and, and tools. So I was kind of like, how do we apply this within the solar industry? Because it's really dynamic and it's really uh, evolving at the same time. So uh, um, very, I would say, very fortunate and really pleased with Grantswell's approach to make uh, data science a really core function of what the organization uh, does. And so um, when, when I started labs, the very first thing was to be able to ensure that the research that we do, first of all, is informed by the current trends in the industry. But secondly, how can we utilize some of the takeaways, you know, the call to actions from uh, uh, the research from labs to be able to uh, design programs? So I started in 20, uh, 20, in 2020, I published an article uh, which is termed uh, uh, an assessment of energy impoverishment in the United States. So I look at all the states, 50 states across the United States look at the energy burdens and what that really means, you know, and uh, that research was really important because uh, from that work, we kind of uh, looked at state-by-state uh, -state energy burden analysis, you know, look at some of the components, you know, how does energy burden affect uh, uh, businesses, minority businesses in communities, in disadvantaged communities. Then uh, I went further uh, develop a kind of a reality model so like energy burden is kind of high in rural areas and so what does that really imply so uh i think analytics is really core cool. uh i know there are still existing gaps you know uh but i think uh it's really important that as we look at some of these issues you know that we're discussing today we should be able to ensure that it's kind of evidence-based you know there's a research backing that you know to be able to inform policies, because uh, one of the things that I've noticed, you know, within my very short time of working in the industry here is that, you know, uh, to some extent, advocacy is, is what we do on a daily basis. But, you know, uh, I think, you know, regulators and uh, policymakers will be able to you know uh, see if we attach some numbers to that. 
The second thing is uh, the LEAF toolkit. Uh, very proud of that research. It was a three-year research funded by the U.S. Department of Energy. And uh, I really love what uh, some of the things John said about uh, tribal communities. I'm kind of building the LEAF toolkit uh, right now. So when we launched it last year, we had 453 community solar projects that serve LMI House. So as of today, uh, I think um, uh, we're on track to add another 115 community solar projects. So that is research that I do here at Grantsway. And what that database does is really uh, very crucial, especially within our current environment. So uh, there's a pre-development uh, side of it, you know, the explore function, where anyone interested in building a community solar project can actually learn, you know, experience, you know, case studies and what is happening across the nation to be able to, uh, to design, you know, their own experiences. Uh, one of the things that I'm really looking at, I'm kind of looking at two databases right now. You know, we work collaboratively with Enbridge, so like tribal communities and community-owned projects. So those are really key because uh, what community-owned project implies to us is that we're looking at meaningful benefits. So, uh, and to that, we can set the hypothesis that community solar is really important such, such that communities themselves, these are examples of projects that have been developed by communities themselves. And the aspect of tribal uh, communities is really important. I think uh, John is not wrong to say that, you know, um, there's just this new awareness right now that no community should be left behind, revitalizing communities, you know, and uh, from that uh, energy uh, democracy perspective. So, um, in a nutshell, uh, what I do at Labs is really crucial, you know, to be able to inform decisions about not only uh, tools development, but also in terms of uh, where there are opportunities, you know. So uh, my research normally addresses areas in which there are opportunities, you know, in terms of community solar, the leaf toolkit, uh, there is really massive, um, there, there are a lot of uh, opportunities within the Midwestern states, you know, we don't see many community solar projects there. And again, the regulatory environment has to do with a lot of stuff, but uh, I think data science is becoming really important and uh, research as well to be able to uh, to drive some of this decision. And that's what I do uh, here at Grantsville. That's great. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I, I, I think I would reiterate your point about, um, you know, sometimes the community's lived experience on the ground, having some data and numbers to back that up if you're applying for a federal grant or speaking to policymakers or industry is a powerful thing. Um, so I, I think, yeah, the research is an incredible resource. Um, Jacob, I have a question for you from the chat about community benefits in West Virginia and then whether you could give some examples about what those look like um, and maybe talk a little bit more uh, just generally about community benefit agreements, which is an exciting thing and something that's coming up more and more, um, especially since the Department of Energy is requiring, uh, requiring them for a lot of their um, funding opportunities. So yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. So specifically with that example you gave, the Department of Energy, their latest round of grants uh, had a requirement for community benefit agreements in order to get approved, which is fantastic. You've, we've never really seen that before. Um, and so that has forced a lot of for-profit developers to reach out to workhorse folks like us and say, hey, we want to partner with you because we need a robust community and benefit plan and we don't know what that looks like in Appalachia. And so what we're able to do is come to the table and say, here's the things that we recommend. Here's what we're hearing from community inputs. Here's what we think is relevant and let's, let's discuss the options. So a couple options could be, uh, which this is from an actual application we had done with, uh, with an applicant. 70% of jobs hired for an installation comes from the seven county region surrounding the project. Um, you know, we, we understand there's going to be some jobs like site designer, site engineer, site manager that may not be able to be trained, you know, within our timeline of workforce development. That may take years in a, in a bachelor's degree to do that. Um, but at least we know we can, there's going to be a massive proportion of jobs that are installation, groundwork development, pre-development, supply chains, et cetera, that we can require from a, a local area. Another one would be the the revenues that are generated from this installation. 13% uh, of the, the either the revenues or the benefits go to the county 
that is hosting that installation uh, for their economic development authority. So each year goes into it. It's not just like a one-time payment for the land. It's a continual payment for the lifetime of the installation, and that can be up to 30 years. So that's that's a whole new uh, revenue source for that county. And then another one is is well-paying jobs. So you know we, we require that everyone uh, as as applicable as possible be hired through the IBEW, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, uh, or an equivalent, you know, some sort of equivalent to that, equivalent to a, a living wage salary. Um, and then we would coordinate that with uh, those installers. Another thing as well is um, don't uh, don't disturb a green space for it. So, you know, a solar array is going to be just on, on ground that's not going to grow anything again, pretty much after the installation's installed. You can't grow trees there, you can't grow the crops there, it needs to be maintained. So don't do that on top of a site that's already a green space. Do it on a, either a brownfield site, so a former industrial site, or an abandoned mineland site. Those are our requirements uh, so that it's already disturbed land. It's already land that's got an industrial purpose. Let's continue that and not make a whole nother industrial site out of that. So those are just a few examples of community benefit plans. This exercise really forced us to get all that in writing. We had not done community benefit plans before. We had done community benefit work and had plans around it, but never made it into a whole package. Uh, and so it, it's it's robust and it takes a, a little while, uh, which is okay um, because you wanna get that community input. So we hold town halls and charrettes together, community input, let them know that this opportunity is happening and then try and capture that as best we can in, in an agreement for everyone. Thank you, Jacob. Yeah, I think community benefit agreements are can be a really powerful tool. They, as Jacob said, they take they can take time and energy and thought, which is good and needed. Um, so definitely, it, it would encourage people in the audience maybe are unfamiliar and seeing projects in their communities to learn a little bit more. And there's resources and toolkits out there uh, to do that. Um, John, I have a question for you about um, whether tribal communities can access IRA and bill dollars, um, whether you have to apply through the Bureau of Indian Affairs to get those, or can you apply to like grant programs at EPA or DOE directly? Sure, that's a great question. It, it kind of depends on the funding or the funders. So um, audience members may or may not know are the other esteemed panelists that um, according to the IRS code by design, every federally recognized American Indian tribe in the country is a 501c3. So they have an opportunity to go after some of these uh, fundings that, that come out from various government agencies. It does not have to pass through the Bureau of Indian Affairs. If there's something that deals with uh, you know, building or developing on land, that's where there's this inherent obstacle built in. A perfect example, like let's say a federal opportunity does come down to provide um, funding for building homes. So that's that's all great. Now we have to go through the Bureau of Indian Affairs if a person is a landowner, or let's say you're not a landowner, you can go get a residential land lease. You still have to wind your way through the Bureau, the Bureau of Indian Affairs residential lease process. So it doesn't, for, for us at Red Cloud Renewable, we're not you know a tribal organization, quote unquote, we are tribal members that operate a nonprofit on the, on the, on the, on the reservation. So um, sometimes a bigger funding opportunity will ask for a tribal resolution or a government resolution. And that's whenever red cloud renewable, we don't have that same, we're, you know, we're not hamstringed by that process. We can go in and sign an MOU. We can go in and enter into a contract um, with an organization that wants to us to do workforce development, for example. So, the BIA still has an influence, and for for us as a community-based organization, we're not required to to go through them, um, and unless there's something with specific to land where it impacts us in our ability to deliver. So I hope that kind of answered the question. It's really complex. It's not the most cleanest answer. It's like, and what's the best move in chess, right? It just depends on the scenario, the funders, and who's around, who may benefit, the timelines. Um, all these things to consider. So hope that answers. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yeah, I mean, I think it broadly that speaks to the a challenge that tribal communities face in accessing funding is just the complexity of of where and, and navigating these systems, the federal bureaucracy, and then, the, you know, the tribal government and that those issues too. Mm -hmm. um, 
We have a little bit of time left. I want to switch gears a little bit and, and turn to you, Eric, because I, I want to, um, something you mentioned at the, at the top of the panel about workforce development is how we get to environmental justice. I, I have never kind of heard it framed that way. I'm, I would just, I would love to hear you kind of expand on that a little bit. And then also, um, careers from where you sit, I mean, Orsted is, is, a, is a large company, has invested millions in workforce development. If you could maybe highlight some trends you might be seeing in, in the clean energy workforce about, are we gonna be focusing on more like union apprenticeships or pre-apprenticeship programs or you know early career job training, just some trends that you're kind of paying attention to that you think folks might might be interested in hearing about? Yeah, great question. And I'll, I'll try to answer all of them. So so help me out if I miss one. Maybe I'll, I'll start with the last question around um, pre-apprenticeship and, and early career um, um, opportunities. So full disclosure, I, I come from pre-apprenticeship. So I, I used to work uh, for, for most of my career at non-traditional employment for women, uh, pre-apprenticeship in New York City, focused on, you guessed it, uh, getting more women into the trades um, in New York. Um, so obviously big fan of the model. Um, and so since I've joined, uh, we've we've put, um, I, I forgot the exact number, it's uh, one point something million dollars um, into pre-apprenticeship in in various kind of markets where, where we need more construction workers. Um, and so it's, uh, for those who don't know, pre-apprenticeship is, is the direct pipeline for someone who doesn't have very many qualifications to get them ready for the rigors of an apprenticeship program uh, that's offered by, by the building trades unions. And uh, was was really uh, heartened to hear Jacob's commentary on, on uh, requirements to have IBW or, or an equivalent. Um, I'm a big believer in, and Orsted's a big believer in unionized labor and, and, and working directly um, uh, with unions and in collaboration with unions who really, you know, are, as I said in my, my previous comments, you know, it's it's not enough to have one organization measuring something or keeping something accountable. You really need, uh, you know, a union in the mix or other worker organization to make sure that that a workplace is, um, is as much as it can be for the workers who are there, both in terms of safety and remuneration. Um, so, so we're, we're definitely seeing, you know, more more trends towards um, towards pre apprenticeship. Um, but I'll say, you know, the the one the one thing that that um, I think we have to be cognizant of as as developers is that it's not enough to say, hey, let's put more money into job training that that I think inherently and and very positively and necessarily is going to prepare environmental justice um, communities, uh, black and brown folks, women um, and and others to enter these careers. We also have to generate the demand on our side. It's not enough to just do the training. There has to be careers on the other end. You can train a thousand people to become, uh, you know, uh, apprentice electricians. But if the IBEW's market share continues to shrink because developers are going the other direction and saying, well, you know, you know, I, I don't, I don't need to, you know, go, go that route. You know, I, I can, I can cut corners. I can go non-union. That creates fewer, and or it diminishes the number of opportunities that that folks can have to to go into those high quality careers. So. So super, super important that we look at both ends of, of the of the job development um, uh, or, or kind of the career development um, pipe. Um, and so, you know, we we're uh, we're committed to project labor agreements on on everything we do onshore and offshore. We're we're the first developer in the U.S. and I think still maybe the only um, to have an offshore project labor agreement uh, for for offshore installation work. Um, and you're your first question i've i've lost it so so hit me with it again i'm sorry i can ask it again no it's my fault for cramming five <laughs> questions in one it was to talk a little bit more about how uh workforce is a path to environmental justice it's not sort of yeah. like that that kind of uh, philosophy yeah yeah i love the question and and i i think the the main the main characteristic of our approach to environmental justice is as i said listening to to local communities who who are organizing for very different things the the same the same things that uh, a Rhode Island group uh, is asking for are not the same as a group um, in the Bronx. There are different environmental justice conditions um, in each of those places, and and they're asking for different things. And so you know um, I think that's uh, the 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 kind of overarching theme is that we are we are not having you know one prescription for what environmental justice means. But you know, in my role, you know, what I can offer up to folks is, is some workforce development solutions. Um, but then I'm also responsible for making sure that we we expand what what we could be doing and thinking about things that are maybe ancillary uh, ancillary to to workforce development in service of environmental justice. So, I'll give you an example, uh, we've proposed uh, our latest proposal for a new offshore wind farm um, in New York is, is called Sunrise Wind Two. Um, Sunrise Wind One will be will be done in about three years, uh, but this is uh, sort of follow on to that. Um, 
And one of the aspects of the proposal is to bring uh, the point of interconnection, to bring the clean energy directly to the South Bronx. And so, you know, probably every, everyone who's under, on this panel or, or, or uh, listening to this panel, I should say, probably knows that the South Bronx is, is one of uh, the most overburdened environmental justice communities in the country. Now, what we're, what we're saying is, okay, it's not enough. And it's not really what we're saying. It's, it's what groups in, in the neighborhood are saying. Like, you know, that's great that, you know, you want to bring in this, this clean energy. But what does that mean for us? We still have our substations. We still have our, we still have our highways. We still have our our um, our short and medium or our um, our light and medium duty trucks that are doing short range deliveries for Amazon and other warehouse space companies. So what so what does that really do for us, right? Yeah, you know, are we going to reduce the their peaker plant usage by a, by a pretty substantial margin? Yeah, we will, but that's not everything. So in addition, what we propose in addition to I think it's seventeen or eighteen million dollars in workforce development funding, we're also proposing to find a way so upfront a million dollars to study how to electrify the truck traffic in Hunts Point. It doesn't have a whole lot to do with workforce development, but it has a whole lot to do with the way people work and the way that that commerce happens. Um, and of course, the way the pollution happens in that neighborhood. Um, we've also committed to to having um, uh, to having kind of a community driven um, kind of allocation of these funds. So we're not going to step away and say, yeah, here, here's your money. Good luck. Right. And, uh, you know, I think it, it's been brought up a couple of times about kind of expertise and you know needing to have everybody at the table. So it's it's something where we're going to put this, um, this this large amount of grant money forward to this community and say, here are some things that you should know about to connect with the different economic opp uh, opportunities that are going to be associated with this project. But how do you want to spend it? When do you want to spend it? How much do you want to spend it on? Um, and so, to us, you know, it's it's you know to, the, the, one of those core principles in in, in the EJ world of self determination is something we try to build in, you know, even to our grant funding um, uh, in that way. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, what a, a great example, and and I think that's something. Um, yes, that my organization has has struggled with too. When you know, like the there's a lot of other tangential issues, and be like, well, we only work on this little energy, you know, this one solar project, we only work on urban parks, but like if you're working in environmental justice communities, the issues are so much bigger and you sort of have to meet communities where they are, listen to them. So I um, appreciate you raising that. Uh, we just have a few minutes left. We could, uh, I, I know I could keep having, uh, asking all of you many, many questions and and Jacob had to had to leave uh, due to a laptop battery, but he sends his, uh, his well wishes. So I want to end with a question for all the panelists about, um, what aspect of your work in clean energy and with communities are you most excited about right now? If we can sort of end on a positive, optimistic note about what you're excited about, what you're looking forward to. Um, Cara, can I start with you? Oh, sure. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, well, uh, I, I think there's a few things. First of all, the, the innovation that is, um, that we will start seeing around community solar projects specifically, since that's my kind of realm, things like agrovoltaics, for instance, where there's uh, agriculture meet, meets photovoltaics, which is solar. And um, there's extensive research being done in Vermont and Colorado. Uh, and, and, and the important thing about agrovoltaics is it's almost mo more than preserving land for agriculture. I think it helps us bridge these um, kind of misinformation or conspiracy theories or whatever you want to talk about it, naysayers about or politicization of solar, where, um, you know, people see solar farms cropping up in an, in an old field that used to grow corn or what have you. So I think, um, you know, there's plenty of land outside of agricultural zones that can be used for utility scale or, you know, these smaller community solar type projects. Um, but innovation like agrivoltaics can help us bring more people to the table, right? Bring, bring more people into um, looking to the future where we can use innovative practices and, and, and then things like um, 
storage at community solar projects where these projects can be um, separated from the grid and turned into microgrids to support um, critical need in the event of a blackout uh, for a hospital or a municipality or what have you. Um, and, and, you know, and also just the workforce development um, and getting more people included in this transition, which is not only to do with building the infrastructure, but the outreach and, and the communication and all of that is all very exciting. Um, I also look forward to influencing developers that are building projects, you know, um, so often they are largely influenced by banks and financiers and, and then maybe policy that doesn't align with the ultimate goal of increasing access. So really um, pushing back on some of, uh, you know, the Wall Street uh, banks that are um, supporting and financing these projects because, uh, you know, what they see as maybe something, you know, so straightforward and, and they've got to manage their bottom line, we need to increase the access and we need to reduce barriers through legislation and policy. And um, so those are the things that I'm most excited about. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you. All exciting things. I think we're over time, but I'm going to keep going until someone yells at me. Dr. Maleka, <laughs> maybe in like 10 seconds, could you tell us what you're excited about? I'll try to keep it 10 seconds. So um, the very first thing for me is uh, just a market characterization. So uh, I really like the fact that I can use data like GPS, you know, to be able to uh, make decisions, you know, to like, hey, if you tell me we're trying to find A, B, and C, we don't know what to do, you know, I come in there and solve the problem. Um, uh, I also love the progress, you know, uh, uh, industry-wide, a lot of all of us sitting here today are making tremendous effort for our, our industry. So that motivates me. And it's like finding people who genuinely care about helping others, you know, so that is a motivating factor for me. And lastly, very proud of what Groundswell does, you know, as an organization. So uh, those are really tremendous uh, uh, motivating factors for me. Thank you. Eric, what are you the most excited about your work right in service of time i'll keep my quick uh it's that um, our first u.s offshore wind farm south fork wind the the first uh, new york offshore wind farm first utility scale offshore wind farm in the country is going to be done this year uh three other offshore wind farms um, on our books going into construction uh either end of this year or beginning of next year um and all infused with the kinds of things that we've been talking about today um, so I, I guess, you know, selfishly, you know, we, we work, we work very hard and it's going to be really, really exciting to, to start telling some stories, um, about, about the kind of justice we are able to deliver over the next, uh, year or so. Thank you. And John, let's end with you. What are you most excited about in your work right now? Yeah. Thank you for the question. I think for us here on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, it's, it's having the, you know, have it, have it conceptualized folks at solar can be for everybody. It's not an affluent household acquisition and that it's not some, you know, mystical technology. It's something that can be taught. You know, it doesn't require a high level of difficulty. I mean, you're working with a little bit of electricity, but part of it is just, you know, getting that determination and knowing that you can work on solar, that you can do something empowering and uplifting and, you know, um, which is great for our coal so I'm I'm just excited that we're helping to create the solar workforce, you know, for tomorrow's energy future. Thank you so much. So uh, wonderful note to end on. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for your time and for your thoughts and, for, and most importantly for your work in this space. Appreciate it very much. Um, I uh, would encourage folks who are listening in to, to check out all the organizations um, and, and learn more. Thanks to Siege for your work on the symposium. And, and yeah, with that, we'll end. Um, go forth and do good work in the clean energy industry, folks. Thanks. Thank you.